time to meet us today. Just start by giving us an introduction, your name, and a little bit about your profession. Uh, my name is Dr. Gladwell Carrier, I'm a physician, a consultant physician, uh, who has uh, subspecialized in cancer treatment. So I'm what you'd call a medical oncologist. I treat uh, cancer patients mainly in the aspect of giving chemotherapy and also manage all other health-related medical conditions that are associated with cancer or side effects of the treatment. Um, medical oncologists work in a multidisciplinary team with radiation oncologists, with surgical oncologists. We usually need pathologists in the diagnostic formulation and radiology. So it's the sort of discipline that you cannot work you know, alone. You need you know, the whole team support. We work with counselors, with nutritionists, um, and other than surgical oncologists, also in people who specialize in cosmetic surgery and also work a lot with the counseling team. Uh, because of some of the things that patients go through. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a particular cancer that you focus on, or is? And unfortunately, I was I was trained to manage both solid, what we call solid tumors and hematological tumors, and sometimes you get a liking for one, um, you know, particular area that you'd like to focus on. But when I came back home from my training, you find that we are not too many specialists, so you cannot have quite the luxury to treat only one or two malignancies that you like, mm -hmm. that they would do in Western countries. So you find that we deal with malignancies across the board. So there's been like a sharp, you know, like a sharp increase in diagnosis lately. Is it that we're giving cancer more press now? Or is it people are now discovering, people are getting cancer more? What is happening now? Yes, if you read the media, you know, the last few weeks, um, you get the sort of idea that it seems to be sort of a crisis, that the numbers seem higher. And many people are asking, is the prevalence of cancer increasing? Mm -hmm. Around the world, as we see with non-communicable disease, you know, diseases that are not related to infections, be it diabetes, kidney disease, uh, uh, chronic um, lung conditions, we do find that the prevalence of cancer, like some of these non-communicable diseases, have a good global trend to increase. For example, in 2018, about 9.8 million people in the world died of cancer, and 70% of those come from the lower to middle income countries. So the lower to middle income countries where probably we've not gotten our prevention policies right, we don't have adequate money for treatment, patients come late, our mortalities tend to be higher. So the thoughts of increasing prevalence are probably patients are living longer in developed countries. Uh, two, of course, we've improved our diagnostics. I can say in Kenya in particular, you know, there are more MRIs or imaging techniques, ultrasounds. There are more pathologists to be able to make the diagnosis. And, you know, there are more diagnostic formulations. And as much as we complain that the access is not adequate enough, there are more people going for tests and there is more awareness that cancer exists. So that can lead to sort of what we call a measurement bias because we are looking for it, we are finding it. There was a time there are many people who died without knowing what they were suffering from. So having said that, you've noticed also more outspokenness Absolutely. about cancer. And this is a very, very good thing that cancer is sort of losing the stigma because many people come up and say, you know, so-and-so died of cancer. People come up and say, I have stage four cancer, I'm not curable, more in the press. And this leads to, you know, a sort of awareness about the disease, which may translate to an impression that the disease is more than it is. But having said that also, our lifestyle changes. You know, we sit more, we walk less, we drink more alcohol, people are smoking more, our diets have changed. So these sort of lifestyle changes have also led to an increase in cancer, but also in non-communicable disease in general. You know, diseases like diabetes and hypertension. Because for example, we are taking more salt than we used to in the 1950s. So all those lifestyle changes have translated to an increase in, in some of these um, uh, cancers. Yes. So would you say those, those lifestyle changes are what is triggering the cancer? And, well, we can't wholly attribute it to that. Um, having said that, probably there were many people who died of cancer and never got diagnosed. 
we think the triggers of cancer come from probably having an underlying genetic risk and then you get an environmental trigger and some of these environmental triggers are you know habits like smoking as i mentioned taking alcohol they are also what we call infective causes that like they are malignants that are associated with hiv disease there are some as you know that are associated with human papilloma virus with things bacteria like h pylori uh, we have cancers that are associated with hepatitis c and b and of course you know exposure to ionizing radiation remember in the areas where we had the world war ii uh, bomb blasts um, in these areas there are very high incidences of cancers malignancies um, also exposure to the other radiation that we use for example mammograms x-rays ct scans also portend a certain risk um, there are theories about aging. The longer you live, the more you're likely to be exposed to an environmental risk mm -hmm. that will lead to a cancer. Dietary issues have been uh, you know, discussed, issues to do with hormonal contraceptive and so on and so forth. We think that cancer is a very multifaceted disease. You know what people say that sugar will give you cancer? It's not as simple as that. Mm -hmm. It's not as simple as that. Yeah. So let's go to the genetic you're talking about. Eh? If a particular family member, for example, if a family member has suffered, has battled cancer, mm -hmm. does that increase your chances of battling cancer? Let's say your parents have battled cancer to you, that is your chances of contracting cancer increase. You can, now we know that there are certain genetic syndromes that exist and inherited familial mutations uh, for certain malignancies. That is not the case for all cancers. For example, if your mother had breast cancer or ovarian cancer, we do know that they are inherited genes, we call BRCA1 and 2, and they are also what we call hereditary breast ovarian syndromes. Those can be inherited from your parents and give you an increased risk to developing a malignancy. And that's why you see somebody like this famous actress, Angelina Julie, removing her breasts and her ovaries, because in their family, she they do have this inherited genetic risk, and she has tested positive for it. So we do get those sort of familial uh, inherited mutations and we do also get syndromes, medical syndromes that predispose one to a malignancy. So we talk about certain genetic mutations and chromosomal abnormalities that we even look for and target to treat. So it is the mutation that gave you the disease but now scientists are turning around and targeting that very mutation in treatment, for example, you know, giving a drug that would correct the chromosomal abnormality so that the less chromosomal abnormal chromosomes you have, the the better response you get from your cancer. Mm. Mm. So from the patients you've seen, for patients who've come to see you, are there cancers that are more common than others in Kenya? Are there worse? definitely, yeah. definitely Grace. Now in our setup we have in women Breast and cancer of the uterine cervix are the commonest malignancy. As we've, con as we've continued to collect data, we've realized that cancer of the throat is actually very common both in men and women. So men will have prostate cancer and cancer of the throat. Women will commonly have breast cancer, cancer of the cervix and cancer of the throat, esophageal cancer. Then we have stomach cancers, colorectal cancers, and liver cancer following in close proximity. Those are the commonest malignancies that we have locally. And there has been good collection of data by the Kenya Medical Research Institute in collaboration with GlobalCan, um, you know, giving us publications that show that this is actually the case as the commonest malignancies. Of course, the greater number are in women. So women are more predisposed to cancer than men? It seems Why so? we have bigger numbers of mm. cancers across the board. If you count all cancer patients, mm find that the, the women are more. Why? You know, the fraction is more. Is some... um, uh, probably a multi, multiple factors. Uh, it is very probable that we are not picking all the prostate cancer that is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, while as the breast is a very obvious organ, so when it has a growth, eventually a malignancy will be detected. Men, the prostate is quite hidden and some of the tests that we do for prostate cancer are quite difficult. The blood test, which is not routinely available, and of course some of the tests to do a prostate biopsy 
are not a very attractive process to men because it involves either a digital rectal exam or doing a transrenal rectal ultrasound and taking a biopsy. So we do think that there are many people, men dying without knowing that they are dying of prostate cancer because the manifestations of advanced disease are, for example, fractures in the bone, difficulty in walking, lack of control of urine, probably spread to the chest and to the liver that would not be directly attributable to prostate cancer unless a good, you know, physician review or the correct blood test is done. Yeah. And we actually have seen that our patients are younger than we read in the textbooks. You know, cancer seems the, higher, the numbers are higher in women, uh, but this could be a measurement bias in that we are not picking up the prostate cancer in men, and also the health-seeking behavior of women is a little more positive. Mm -hmm. So if you go for a screening campaign, women will come to have a pap smear done, men will not come to have a digital rectal exam. They will exam. not volunteer. So, and will not volunteer. So it could be that we're not picking up the numbers in men. And of course, I've mentioned the regional demographic details, uh, differences that we've picked up by having data on county basis, which will help guide policy, and we'll be able to see in the different regions what is important for us. And of course, doing research to see what is attributable to those malignancies being different. And of course, we've seen that cancer has really no limits as far as economics and the social strata is concerned. It will get everybody. And the other thing is that we do notice that in Africans, just as they've seen in America, in Afro-Americans, our cancer tends to come early. So I guess research will advise whether we have different genetic mutations, whether we have different outcomes on standard treatment, and probably that will be a very exciting future, yeah. um, you know, sort of research to be able to see if we can improve outcomes in Africans in general. But also in America, when they do big trials, they actually notice that the people with African blood tend to present earlier with cancer than probably the white cell. Yeah. So strange. Yeah, it is. This is... Thank you or so Or maybe we live for a shorter period so we get it. <laughs> yeah. I know, yeah, very good. Thank you very much.